Good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining us. We'll uh, get started here in just a couple seconds while people are filtering in. Hope everyone's having a good morning so far. All right, people are coming in. Morning, Gail. Morning, Lisa. Morning, Michelle, Rob. Thank you guys so much for coming in. Well, my name is Cassie Hopkins, and I help coordinate the webinars over here at Houseman Group. We're excited to have you with us this morning. I'm going to go over just a couple housekeeping things, give a little introduction to our speaker, Rick Barton, and, and then he's just going to take over and teach you guys all about OSHA record keeping, brand new this year for 2024. So just so you are aware, this webinar is recorded, which means that you can access it at any time after the webinar has completed. You're also gonna get an email to a link to that recording, as well as a copy of our PowerPoint slides. If you have any questions for Rick Barton during the presentation, you can type them in during the question and answer feature on Zoom, or you can also use the chat feature. We'll be checking both throughout the presentation. If there's something that we think is timely, we'll answer it right away, but otherwise we'll save all the questions for the end. We are also hope that you can fill out a survey for us at the end of the, re the presentation. We love hearing from you guys and just hearing what new topics you're interested in learning more about and what you thought of this topic as well. So without further introductions, I'm gonna let it go over to Rick Barton. Rick has over 20 years of experience in safety and risk control, working with clients in many industries, including construction, mining, trucking, manufacturing, and hospitality. He specializes in assessing risk for the clients of Houseman Group to reduce loss potential. Through safety assessments and loss analysis, Rick develops solutions which include safety management techniques, training, and engineering. Additionally, he has been asked to speak at local and national safety conferences on topics such as how to manage safety on a job site, and what it takes to be a safety leader. Thanks so much for being here. Welcome, Rick. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us on this uh, nice end of January day, getting ready for the uh, big push by OSHA. Uh, when I say that, uh, we've got things that are coming due in the next uh, two days and then 29 days, so or about 30 days, I should say. So. Um, wanted to spend a little time talking about those, and I will uh, at the as we go through the presentation and uh, deal with this. There have been a few new updates this year for those of you that may be in certain industries for uh, filing your or, or electronically record uh, submitting your 300 A's and your 300 and maybe even your 301, depending on your industry. So with that said, I'll get into that as we go through this, but uh, I am going to do an overview on record keeping uh, that will include uh, a few things that might not touch on everyone's needs, but I think they're very important for, for everyone to understand who keeps records and who does not. So today's focus topics will be, uh, uh, first of all, who needs to keep records? Uh, there are companies um, I deal with and our organization deals with that do not have to keep OSHA uh, 300 logs. Um, there are several of those, and then I'll go through that. I'll share with you guys some lists of those uh, companies that would not have to uh, keep logs. Uh, I will also go over when, what, and how to fill out your log. Uh, I, will, I have a couple examples on a log already pre-populated to give you some examples. And when I get there, we'll talk a little bit about those. Keep in mind, I can't cover every scenario in a short synopsis like this, um, but I'm more than willing to answer those questions after the webinar or during our Q&A later today. Um, also wanna make sure everyone's aware that uh, they do have to report some incidents to OSHA. I'll go over what those are, where you have to report them, and how quickly you have to report those to OSHA. Uh, we'll cover uh, completing the OSHA 300A, um, which is rather simple if you use the Excel spreadsheet that you can get, which downloads your 300 information onto that, and then you just have a few fill in the blanks. But there is information that still has to be completed by you, even with that, uh, that drop down. And then we'll get into who and what needs to file uh, with OSHA electronically every year. Uh, there are many of us that have to file. Uh, with OSHA electronically. Uh, we still have until March 2nd. I'll get into that a little bit. And then last but not least, 
I wanted to just spend a few minutes on some miscellaneous record keeping things that uh, what I did is I went back and I looked at what do people ask me most frequently? Uh, what kind of records do we need to keep? How do we need to keep those? And for how long do we need to keep those? So I'll just touch on those based on um, the amount of time that we might have available at the end of this discussion. As Cassie said, um, keep your questions till the end. Um, you can type them in. We'll go through those at the end, see how many we can get through. And uh, like always, uh, after any webinar, you're always more than willing to uh, give us a, a shout or call us and see what we know. So with that said, let's get into um, who needs to actually do an OSHA log, right? You know, a lot of people look at me and they say, Rick, do I need to do an OSHA log? Well, most likely you do. Um, there's a couple of qualifiers though. If you have 10 or less employees throughout the year, there's no need to record, no matter what industry you're in. You could be in a manufacturing uh, NAICSIS code, National uh, Industrial Classification Code, North American Industrial Classification Code, and you would have to, would not have to fill out an OSHA log if you never have more than 10 employees during a given year. If you peak at 11 employees, you now have to do a 300 log if you are in industries outside of the ones that are in our append in, in the appendix. And I thought for ease, we would just go to that appendix and share with you uh, what that appendix is. So on your screen, you should be seeing the uh, appendix and you will see that basically if you have a NAICSIS code over 44, there's a chance you might not, not have to keep an OSHA log. Now you have to meet both uh, criteria. You either have to be uh, over, uh, less than 10 employees or if you're over 10 employees, then you would not have to fill out an OSHA 300 log or keep that log. Um, so if you have a traveling salesperson that gets hurt, you have someone in your operation that slips and falls, uh, it would not need to be recorded if you're in these industries. And as you can see, there's quite a few industries. I call these, uh, don't take this the wrong way, but I, I think OSHA looks at it as soft industries. Uh, there's other terms that I've heard used, uh, but industries that typically don't have as many injuries so OSHA has exempted them from keeping uh, logs. For example, if I run a gas station, I don't need to keep a log. Even if I'm over 10 employees, I wouldn't have to keep a log. If I'm under 10 employees, it doesn't make a difference what industry. Uh, you scroll down here and you might see some other things like uh, uh, if I run a, uh, well, look at us. We're in the insurance brokerage area, 5242. We don't have to keep an OSHA log. Um, and then as you go down here, if you're in a, a school, an elementary school, secondary school, colleges, they don't have to keep uh, logs uh, at this point. So they do not have to keep those records. Uh, full service restaurants, uh, limited eating places. So a McDonald's uh, would not need to keep a, an OSHA log. Uh, your Ruth Chris does not have to keep a, 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 an OSHA log. Uh, so those are just establishments that are not required. Uh, drinking places, uh, so bars that uh, are, are, are there, don't have to keep the logs. Again, these are just a list, I don't know how many there are, maybe 80 or 90 uh, different industries that do not have to keep lists. So uh, just wanted to uh, make everyone aware that uh, we do not have to keep logs uh, for those industries. So with that said, um, Everyone now probably has an idea. Maybe some people dropped off and said, hey, I don't have to keep an OSHA log. Okay, great. Um, but even if you don't have to keep an OSHA log, you still may have to do certain things like call OSHA or file with OSHA uh, an injury report for certain types of injuries. So you need to stay online until I get to, when do I have to call OSHA about a specific in, uh, injury? So uh, so that's, that's one thing that we have to keep in the back of our minds. So, Probably why everyone here is is here is for several reasons, but the most important I think is, you know, filling out your OSHA log. But before we do it, what is an OSHA log? Well, it's a nice big 11 by 17 uh, hard copy log that basically you fill out every time you have an injury that is recordable. The 300 log records all employee related work injuries and probably should say illnesses. So anything work-related, 
And you might have questions on when something is work-related and when it isn't. Save those questions for the end. If I don't cover them, I can cover them. I'll just give you a couple examples. If I am uh, out on a, I am sent to do some work outside of town, I now check into the hotel. Once I check into that hotel, I am no longer working. I am now on my own personal time, so I am not working for the company. Therefore, if I did get injured, maybe while I was working out that evening in the hotel, that would not be work-related. And there's many others, but those that's just a good example. Um, if I'm in a parking lot and I, I'm driving in and I'm in a, a vehicle accident, I'm, on my, I'm conveying myself to work. I really haven't gotten to work yet. Even if I'm in a company parking lot, that would not be work-related. Again, just a couple examples that you might uh, run across. Um, Keep in mind, the log does need to be completed within seven days of the injury. So if I have an injury today, I need to get that on a log by next week, uh, Tuesday. Uh, you have seven days. Once you realize it is a recordable incident, or once you need to get it on within seven days of the incident, you do have some time to figure out if it's recordable or not. And I'm going to touch on what type of incidents may or may not be recordable. Um, I bring this one up because so often we look at OSHA logs. And I'll be there in August and someone gives me a log from log for that year. And there's no instance past February and uh, they've had several accidents and it's, they don't put them on the log. Well, you need to get those on the log because if OSHA shows up, if OSHA shows up and asks for your log, you need to make that available to them within four hours. That sounds like a lot of time, but if you have a bunch of entries to make and you have entries that still need to be updated, you need to get those updated and get it to OSHA. And again, it's not a way to get around OSHA, but you need to keep them up to date within seven days. And you might not have access to all that information very readily. Um, the other thing that I find, and I see this often, is I'll look at a log right now. We're reviewing logs for several customers in terms of, you know, what was on that log. Maybe I'm doing an audit or something like that uh, at a facility. And I look at how many recordable lost and restricted days do they have? That combination of days can never peak go over 180 days. So keep that in mind. Um, I'll, I'll be sharing with you a log real soon here. Just uh, hang on everyone. Um, we'll get to that. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention is there are very, there are several scenarios which you may go to the clinic, you may go to a, a, the hospital and they are not recordable. There's actually what OSHA calls 14 first aid only uh, type of uh, services you can get at the hospital that are not recordable. Um, for example, employee goes to the hospital. Maybe they uh, they don't have, they have just they, they're in for observations and the doctor prescribes over the counter Tylenol. As long as it's taking at uh, non at, at just non prescription levels, then it would not be recordable. Again, non prescription levels. If it's taken at the daily dose, so 200 milligrams, 400 milligrams uh, every six hours, whatever that is, based on what the bottle says, that's fine. Once you jump above that, now it might become recordable. Um, using massages and, and other uh, therapies. Uh, if you go to just get your eye cleansed out and they're not pulling any solid particles out of your eye, that may not be recordable. Sometimes you need to talk to the f treating physician, PA, nurse, whoever it is that, uh, assist your employee. So again, keep that in mind. You can always go back and put it on the log and scratch it out later. Uh, that's fine. And with the electronic logs, it's pretty easy to delete entries and uh, uh, make your log current. Uh, last, I wanted to mention is you need to record every day of the week. Just ran across this where uh, a customer was uh, recording just work days. So they work five days a week. So at the end of the month, they had 21 days, 20 days on there. No, you need to record every day, Monday through Sunday, okay? Seven days a week. It makes it easy for everyone to just keep track of that. It really came about because of the uh, employers that work those uh, 312s and take a few days off, work 212s, or maybe working 10s, not working on Friday. Uh, to make it simple, OSHA just said, Mr. Employer, you're going to record every single day. We're going to be consistent across the board. Uh, you may or may not like it, but that's what OSHA requires of us to do. So we record 
every day of the week. We don't just record the days that they were uh, at work. So if an employee is injured today on Tuesday and they're off until next week, Wednesday, that may be eight days of recording. You don't record the, the day of the injury, but you'll record the next day and that every day after until they get back. So seven, eight days, whatever those days are. So you would include Saturday and Sunday in those recordings. What else do we have to think about? Well, we have to think about how to fill out that OSHA log, right? So a lot of us uh, have to do those. They should be updated. Last year should already been done. You may have to make some entries on those logs yet. Um, so you may have someone out of work yet that hasn't returned. They might be on restrictions. So every seven days you should be going in and updating that log to make sure that those days are accurate to the uh, day of the month we're at. Um, so what I thought I'd do is just pull up a log and let's take a look at a log. So what you're gonna see is you're gonna see an OSHA log pop up here. And uh, actually it's uh, popped up on a 300A, but this is an Excel spreadsheet that we use to link these logs together. So what I did is I, uh, this is what the OSHA log looks like, a pretty simple um, pr product that OSHA has for us. Uh, don't forget to put up on the right-hand corner the year. Uh, make sure that your establishment's uh, the name is there and uh, the city and state that you're in, okay? You may have you may have an organization that might have three or four establishments. You will then be keeping three or four logs. If that establishment is open for more than a year or is existing for more than a year, you would have to fill out a log for that establishment and keep that log separate. If you have, for example, you might have four or five locations all in one city that are required to keep logs, then you would have four or five uh, logs, one for each of those establishments. Hey, Rick. Um, yes. It looks like we can't see the log. We're still on your PowerPoint slides. Would you mind Rick. sharing that? Uh, how do I do that? Could still they see the last one? So when you open that link, just exit the PowerPoint and click that. Okay. Open. We can do that. So, let's see. Did it come up this time? So I saw your um, taskbar, and it's it's still on our PowerPoint slides. I see why it's not coming up. That's why. Okay, we'll see what we're going to do. Oh, are we up now? No, we're not. It's not showing up. Let's try this. This should work. How are we doing now? So it looks like you're opening the link. So why don't you go over to your, your Internet Explorer or Chrome or whatever you're using? Yeah, we'll, we'll open it up if I can. There we go. Yep. OK, so then you're going to want to exit out of PowerPoint and then put that up. Working on it. Oh, wait. New shoe. All right. Here we go. All right. Why is it not coming out? Oh, we can see, we can see the Excel sheet now, Rick. Oh, you can. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank okay. you. So. The question I have is, which one are you looking at? So I'm on the right one. Um, so I just wanted to go through again, everyone keep in mind, we do have to fill these out at the beginning of the year and, and chronologically go through and fill these out. Um, I just threw a few examples up for everyone so they can see uh, what type of uh, boxes you need to check. So you're gonna obviously put the name of the employee in, you're gonna end up putting the uh, job title um, and that's gonna be very specific to your company. Date of the injury, this is all pretty straightforward and where the accident occurred. You know, they want the location. You know, if it happened off, off premises, you just uh, indicate where it happened. And then they want a short description. 
Um, in that description, though, you may want to keep it fairly brief. I usually just recommend that you put down um, the type of injury, cut, sprain, whatever it is, and then maybe a quick example like I put up here from a sharp edge. You don't need to get any more descriptive than that. You can cover that in your WCK-12, uh, which you're going to submit to the insurance carrier. You can also uh, add that into your incident uh, report and things like that. One thing I do want to mention is that um, your names do have to be in there unless they're what they call sensitive cases to a, uh, a body part that's sensitive, or maybe if it's uh, tuberculosis, a medical condition that could be sensitive. And then you could put a pri you could put in the uh, for the employee name privacy case. OSHA does allow for that. Um, once you put that in, you would then if the description can still kind of employees could figure out who that is, then they uh, you can make that description very vague. Uh, once you go across the, uh, the the page, you'll see you have to check one of the boxes between death, days away from work, re, uh, restricted and or other, other types of cases. Um, so you'll be checking those boxes um, and then you'll put the days of restrictions and or lost time. And you might have both. Um, when you check the boxes, you put the most uh, restrictive ones. So you can see on one of these where I have uh, Mike McCarthy, he was a mechanic, fell from a ladder, broke some ribs and uh, had a concussion. Uh, looks like it spelled concussion wrong, I think. I think my HR per person put that in there, though. Just kidding. Um, but uh, you can see he had days away from work. He also had restricted time. And so uh, that box should only be checked uh, once, and it should not be checked twice. It should just be checked under days away from work. Um, then, as you can see, the days away from work were 109, or restricted days were 109, days away from work were 71. If you notice that equals 180 days, once we hit 180 days, you're done with that, that log entry. You will not add any more days to that. Um, so that gives you kind of an idea. Uh, number four was kind of an interesting one. I've run across this before. You get a salesperson that uh, gets in a car accident. Yes, they are recordable. They are in the course of his, his work. Um, and so you do need to uh, record these. In this case, he didn't have any lost time. Uh, just a little whiplash, was able to do his regular job. He didn't have any uh, functions that he couldn't do part of, as part of his regular job. And those are some decisions you have to make on whether or not they're recordable, uh, not only recordable, but are they lost time or restrictions. Many times employees go to the doctor, they get restrictions, but yet they can do 100% of their job functions. At that time, that is not a restricted case. So you need to make sure you take a look at what the doctor's restrictions are. Um, a lost time case is a lost time case. If they are uh, asked to stay away from work uh, for rest or whatever, then it's a, it's a lost time day. Um, I'm not gonna tell you, you have to call the doctor and ask them why. Um, a lot of times an employee will go in on a Friday, they'll tell them to go back on a, on a, on a Monday. I would question whether or not they can return that Friday because if they can, then we don't have to put any lost time days. If they don't return to Monday, now you have two lost time days for Saturday and Sunday. So it's really good to make sure that that employee comes back to work with their note if the doctor gives them time off um, and tells them to come back on Monday, you could actually question that and maybe reduce that amount of time uh, that they have off. So uh, that's, that's very important. Um, I'm gonna have to pull up my PowerPoint again, because it's gone. So my question, Cassie, is can I got, I'm going to have, I'm sure I'm going to have questions uh, soon on the, uh, on the OSHA log, but uh, in the meantime, I'm going to move on only because of time, and I, I do need to get into some things. Uh, so we can see your PowerPoint. You can? Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's why you're here, Cassie. Thank you. So I'm sure you still have questions about filling out the 300 log. Most people typically do if they haven't done it very often. Um, if you have questions and I can't get to them on this call, by all means, give us a call. And if you work with Ken, uh, our other consultant, he, he knows this just as well. He can also give you, give you some help. So, But what I wanted to do is make sure everyone realizes that 
not only do we have to fill out the 300 logs if we meet those criteria, but we also need to report, report certain types of incidences to OSHA. And uh, the big one that we've had to report forever are deaths and multiple employees hospitalized from one incident. We need to get those to OSHA within eight hours. I'll go through how you report those in a second. Uh, the other one that was added maybe seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years ago was within 24 hours, if you have an employee that has an amputation, you need to let OSHA know. So likewise, if you have an employee that goes to the doctor and is now admitted into the hospital, they need to, you need to report that to OSHA. You can do it either via the phone, via email, or excuse me, through their website, or you can actually go in person and you'll see that in a second. The other one, which I have never, ever seen one, is if you have a complete eyeball loss or an eye loss. Not an eye injury, but an eye loss. Very rare that these happen. It was included as uh, one of the requirements. Uh, so make sure you're aware of that. Uh, too often I'll get someone that calls me and said, hey, Rick, we had, a, we had an employee that was hospitalized because they were, uh, they fell. They had some uh, really bad injuries. And we'll go into the injuries. Uh, and they call me two days later. Well, they, they're already late on reporting. So that can be an issue. So make sure you do report these on time. Um, how do you report those? Those are rel relatively easy. What you can, uh, uh, I'll get into that in a second, but I wanted to give everyone kind of a definition on what OSHA considers as hospitalization. OSHA defines inpatient hospitalization as formal admission to the inpatient service of a hospital clinic for care or treatment, not observations. I've had several cases where employees have gone in, they've been even spent the night for observations, but they never got admitted to the hospital. Therefore, we still have a, a recordable incident, but we don't have a reportable incident that we have to report to OSHA. What's a couple other definitions that OSHA uses? Observation and diagnostic testings. You do not report an inpatient hospitalization that involves only observation or diagnostic testing. You go in for uh, you know, an MRI or whatever, it's a diagnostic uh, test. Uh, you must only report to OSHA each inpatient hospitalization that involves care and treatment, maybe based on those, testings, but if they, it's just testing and it's negative, then we don't have to report it to OSHA. Amputations include avulsions, if you can, enunciations, degloving, scalpings, some severed ears, or, or broken or chipped teeth. Do not include, I should say, I hope I, I said that right. I might have said do. I apologize for that, but they do not include these types of, of injuries. So make sure you understand the difference between an amputation and, and these. Um, we've had several cases where an employee might uh, lose the tip of a finger um, because the bone is gone. And the doctor calls it an amputation. Many times we're relying on the medical practitioner to declare this a, a, an amputation or not an amputation. But uh, if you lose a, a bone, there's a good chance that you're going to uh, have an amputation. Um, even if that amputation is reattached, it's still an amputation. It's got to be reported to OSHA. Um, experience tells me that uh, most, most times when there is an amputation, uh, you're probably going to be dealing with uh, an informal. OSHA gives you a call, has you go through the whole uh, incident report, has you fill out their, their form, and then they might stop on site to see you and, and discuss this incident. So. Just make sure you do fill these, uh, uh, get this information into OSHA. Um, you have three, three ways to get that information to OSHA. One, you can go online, OSHA.gov. There's a, 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 a link on there on how to report an injury. You can either call your local office if you're in Milwaukee, Madison, uh, Appleton, uh, Chippewa, uh, Eau Claire, they have offices there. If you're in Illinois, you call the local office, you all know where you're. If you don't know where your local office is, just go to OSHA.gov and report it. It'll get filtered to the local office because you'll be submitting information like uh, your location, what happened. There's a lot of information that goes into that report. 
And last but not least, you can just give the uh, eight, uh, toll free 800 number a call and report that. It's a live line that will let you report that. Big issue here, report it within that eight hour or 24 hour window. Um, to add injury to insult, if you happen to have an inspection, you don't report it within that window, there's a good chance you could get a, a citation for that. Um, not saying it will happen, but it has happened uh, for not reporting it uh, on time. So make sure you report those. Um, OSHA 300 A's. We've just done our 300 log. Now we need to transfer that to our 300 A's. And I hope everyone's working on this now if they don't have it done because our 300 A's are due by Thursday of this week. They have to be posted in a conspicuous spot within our organization by this week, Thursday. And our 300 A's are basically a summary of our 300 logs. So if you use the Excel spreadsheet that I was using, if I showed you the second page or the second tab, all the information on the first page just automatically drops down to that second tab, calculates the stuff that needs to be calculated and you're good to go. Um, but what's required is that you fill out that 300A and then you post that in a conspicuous place or places where employees are customarily looking at postings. Most of us have our safety boards, right? Or our time clock area. Let's post it there. It's a recap of your injuries. It's going to tell you how many injuries you had. It's going to tell you how many lost time days, how many restricted days. And it's also going to uh, have a little section for man hours. Um, that needs to be posted, like I said, starting February 1st, needs to be left up till April 30th. You can leave it up longer, but you need to make sure that it is posted. The reason I want everyone to make sure they've got it done a day or two earlier uh, is so that you get one of these individuals to sign your 300A. The owner of the company, the top ranking officer of the company at that establishment, uh, the highest ranking company official at that establishment, or the immediate supervisor of that highest ranking official at that establishment must sign the 300A before it gets posted. What are they doing? They're verifying or they're saying, yes, I agree with what's posted here. So in other words, they're trusting that whoever filled out the 300 log that then takes that information and puts it on the 300A, it is truthful and accurate. So Keep in mind, you got less than 48 hours to get this up and post it in your establishments. Um, hopefully many of you already haven't posted. You can post it before April 1st, or excuse me, February 1st. You can keep it up after April 30th. The other big thing that uh, we have to think about is our electronic uh, submission of these records. So not everyone on this call probably has to uh, electronically file, but if you have an establishment that has 20 or more employees, and you're listed in Appendix E, then you must file your 300A. I have a link here. I'm not gonna go to that link right now because I have a simpler way of doing it. I was just looking at the time. I have a simpler way of doing, uh, doing this than showing you all the companies that are required to fill out their 300, uh, 300As and then submit them to OSHA electronically. So what OSHA asks is that you go on their website, you go to the I ITA section, and then you click on the link there. It'll take you to the area where you have to fill out your, or submit your 300 A's. There's a new twist though this year. In 2024, OSHA has added about a hundred establishments or industries that not only have to file their 300 A, but they also have to file their 300s and their 301s. Just a couple comments before I, I take you to, uh, to this link. Um, OSHA says that your 301s basically is an accident investigation report that it's, it's their form. You can fill that out and send it to them. But they also say that in the state of Wisconsin, you could use your WCK 12 which is the first report of incident that goes to your insurance carrier. Well, I'm telling you right now, probably not a good idea. There's information on the WCK-12 that OSHA doesn't need and they shouldn't have. Um, and I've heard this from several legal counsels that you probably should fill out 
the 301 or another like form and submit that to OSHA if that is what you have to do. So if you have over 100 employees and you're in one of the NAICSIS codes that is required, then you're going to have to fill out your 300 and your 301 and electronically fill, uh, send those in the, in the OSHA. So what I have done, Cassie, can they see this? They could, I'm hoping they can. Yes, we can see it. Thanks, Rick. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So this is the list of companies that will have to fill out, but not that you'll have to fill out your 300, your 300 days, and you have to do an equivalent 301. I guess I said that wrong. But what you need to do here is if you're in these Nexus codes, you will actually have to electronically file those, those additional forms in addition to your 300 days. And you can see all the classifications in here. I counted them up. I think there were like 99 of them. And I'm just going to stop up here. So, you know, I said 4,200. I read about 4,200 and down a lot of those industries might not have had to report those, but uh, now they, they, they might have to report their 300. Again, this is only if you're, if you're over 100 employees. So if you're in the uh, hardware manufacturing, 3325, then you have to report and electronically file these with OSHA. So a lot of you are probably thinking, oh, great. Now I have over 100 employees. Am I on this list or what do I have to submit? I'll tell you what, OSHA made it real simple for us. So what they did is they, they actually have this little uh, reporting tool. I'm gonna bring it up here. You can see the link up here, it's OSHA.gov and then it goes ITA report app. And what they do is, Cassie, everyone can see this, correct? Yes. All right. So all you have to do is submit your, you go in here, we're probably gonna be in Wisconsin. Maybe not all you are. You've got over 11 employees. Click that box, peak establishment. Let's just use a couple. Let's say I'm at 89 employees, right? Let's say I'm not a federal government employer. And let's just say I'm in 4248. I just picked this out randomly. I'm in the, I'm a wholesaler of beer. I'm distributing beer around the state or other beverages. And then I submit this. And it says, based on your entries, you are required to report form 300A, and that's it. Pretty simple. Let's go back. Let's do the same thing, Wisconsin. Let's hit yes, let's hit now. Let's jump you up to 120 employees, same location. No, we'll go down here, 42, 48. Submit. Again, we're in the same industry. We just got more employees. Now that org, that establishment has to report their 300, their 301, and their 300A data all to or electronically file that with OSHA. I would recommend everyone on this call that's listening. You probably know your Nexus codes. You can go down that list. It'd be a lot easier to go to this website and let OSHA tell you. So, uh, you know, you might be in here and say we're. Wisconsin, we might have uh, 11 employees, again, uh, peak employment, let's say 130. No, let's say 23. Or, so let's just say we're now in a tobacco manufacturing. Do we have to submit here? Same number of employees, different industry. Uh, we don't have to submit our OSHA. 300s and our 301s. We only have to submit our 300 days. Again, certain industries, OSHA has looked at and said, you're high, uh, having high levels of injuries. We need more information. There's a good chance we might come out and see you. And that's not what they're gonna tell you, but that's kind of what they're saying. So that's kind of what we have to deal with. So, so everyone uh, just keep in mind that you can go to this website and figure out what you have to file with OSHA electronically. You do have a few more weeks to get that in. You have until March 2nd to do the electronic reporting. So don't get all nervous, get your 300 A's done, get those posted by Thursday of this week. 
And then if you are one of these industries that's over 100 employees and in those special NAICSIS codes, then get your 300s and your 301s uh, electronically filed by March 2nd. You can do it right now. Many companies have already filed. Doesn't make a difference when you file. Um, it's all good. So that's that's what we have with the 300. So any so what I want to do is I just have a few final thoughts um, on OSHA record keeping. Uh, running up against the clock a little bit, but that's okay. Uh, keep your logs for the current year plus the previous five years. Make sure they're readily available. Remember that OSHA, if they came in and they asked for your logs, if you look at, at record keeping requirements, they have to be made available to them within four hours. If you have an employee that asks you or their representative, if you're represented by a union or they have legal counsel that's representing them, and they ask for your OSHA logs, yes, you do have to provide them. And you have to provide your 300 ones. Uh, you have until the next, the end of the next business day. So a little bit different. If it's a federal agency, you may have to get those to them a little quicker than if it's an employee or their representative or uh, legal counsel. If you have cases late in the year, so some of you may have had a, a lost time injury late in December and there's still lost time don't create a new entry for 2024. Go back and put those on your 2023 logs. Don't forget, cap those at 180 days. Uh, obviously, we'd have to be back. Our injury would have happened back in, what, August of last year to cap those. Uh, but we do need to cap those at 180 days, combined lost time and restrictions. So just a few thoughts that you need to think about. Um, medical records, I know this is a little off topic for record keeping, but I get this question all the time, how long do we have to keep them? Uh, their employment plus 30 years, good example. If you get rid of a safety data sheet, OSHA kind of uh, interprets that as a medical record. Once you get rid of it, you should have access to that copy of that uh, medical record or that safety data sheet for 30 years. Any medical testing, you know, pulmonary function testing, things like that. For respirator use, if you have silica exposures and you're doing uh, medical surveillance, you would need to keep those for uh, employment plus 30 years. Um, people often ask how long you need to keep training records. I suggest you keep them until you do the next training on that topic. OSHA doesn't, you, you have certain things you have to do every year. Then you have certain things you don't have to do every year. But I always say keep those records uh, for at least as long as until you finish the next training. Um, there, that way, at least you have the most current record. You don't need to go back any further than that. So with that, I am going to finish up with a quick uh, conclusion. Uh, keep your records current, your OSHA log. Remember seven days. Uh, that's a key uh, term. Keep those up within seven days. If you have questions about any recording uh, of an OSHA injury, Feel free to call myself, or call Ken, call your agent. If you have one with us, they'll get a, uh, they'll forward that on to us. Uh, you know, you might not work with us regularly. That's fine. Um, just make sure that uh, if you have questions, we'll be more than happy to help you uh, uh, set that straight. Uh, if OSHA inspects, give us a call. We can help you with that. Ken and I have been out on many OSHA inspections over the years. Uh, and they will look for these OSHA logs and they will expect them to be current. Um, I'll give you a good example. I was uh, helping a client out with an inspection that they were going through last year when we ended up getting our citations. Uh, they peaked at 22 employees the year before that. So 2022, uh, they peaked at 20 employees. They weren't aware that they needed to file electronically. OSHA actually cited them for not filing electronically. When they were out there doing their inspection, they were down to 16 employees, but during their peak season, they had hired a few more employees and brought on those employees. Um, one thing I forgot to mention uh, about keeping your records current, if you are using temporary employees and you supervise them, they go on your logs. So keep, make sure you record temporary employees on your logs. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to mention is OSHA requires training and it must be up to date and done before exposing employees. And I bring that up because I run across this often. 
we get new employees and we put them in situations where we haven't done the formal training, uh, we shouldn't do that until we do the training. O OSHA uh, requires that all employees get trained before we expose them to certain types of exposures in our industries. So with that, I am going to turn it over to any questions or concerns that anyone may have at this point. Can't hear you. I can't hear you, Cassie. Thanks, Rick. Okay, that's why uh, we're a team. It's why we're a team. <laughs> All right. So here's our first question. A couple of years ago, we had over ten employees. So I had my office manager look into reporting, and she said that from what she found, the Wisconsin laws said that we didn't need to report until we had over twenty employees. Is that possible, or was it incorrect information? So you're over 10 employees, you have to keep it if you're in those industries that are, are not are, are, are not exempt. So I gave you that list of exempt industries, you wouldn't have to keep an OSHA log, but you are correct if you're talking about electronic filing, it doesn't hit until you hit 20 employees. So electronic filing does not come into play until you hit 20 employees during that year. At the end, I gave you an example. One of my uh, customers I was working with, they peaked at 22 employees. They weren't aware that they needed to electronically file. And, you know, I, in my defense, they were a pretty new company. They were only in business for a year and a half. And I didn't even know they had 20 employees. So um, we got rid of the OSHA citation, but we still had to deal with it. All right. She said she's in the construction industry. Yep. So if you're over 20 employees in the construction industry, you would have to electronically file. If you're over 10 in that industry, you have to keep your OSHA logs your 300 uh, A's and your 300 ones. All right, our next question is about, I believe, amputations. This person is asking, is it 24 hours from incident or admission to hospital? It's 24 hours from the time you are notified about the amputation. So if the employee, so you go in and, and, and you could almost call that when they get inpatient admitted, because that's usually when you find out, but it's 24 hours. So if they go in and they're, they're going in for surgery and you don't know that it, even though they're admitted into the hospital, you don't know that it was truly an amputation. You may find out after the surgery or the next day, that's when you have the, the 24 hour starts right, right. at that point. Their follow-up question, question was, is losing several fingers an amputation? Is losing several fingers an amputation? Yes. 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 Losing the tip of one finger and some bone has been considered an amputation. Good answer. And our next question is, to what extent do cuts to the hands, and in parentheses they've put Band-Aid, need to be reported? So if it's just first aid, uh, a first aid, uh, administer it to that person and you put a Band-Aid on it, um, that would just be first aid. It would not have to be re recorded on your OSHA 300 log. Um, there are some, there's, like I said, there's 14 first aid uh, scenarios that OSHA does not uh, require uh, recording on your OSHA 300 log. Um, we can make those available to you. I just hit on a couple of those, but that would be a good example of one that would not be recordable. Good question. That looks like all of the questions that have come in. Thank you guys so much for um, your very thoughtful questions. And thank you, Rick, for your responses. With that, we're going to end our webinar. The last couple of things I'll say are if you are looking for more safety and risk control resources, our other uh, risk control guru, Ken Alderden, is doing a Department of Transportation series. So if that's something that interests you as well, um, he will be doing his last webinar later this month. Oh, it's not February yet, but you know. Oh, it is. No, nope. never mind. It's January 30th. <laughs> Sorry, everyone. Um, this webinar is also recorded, so you guys will also get a copy of it. And again, please fill out that survey at the end. We love hearing from you guys and hearing what you thought. So thank you very much. And thank you, Rick, for um, blessing us with your OSHA record keeping knowledge. Thanks for straightening me out. <laughs> Always here for you. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Have a great rest of your morning.